No, sir, no, I know it's not a squirrel, but Drew was just telling me that it's, it, he had to, it's, but it was a tornado. It was really cool of all the leaves. Okay, see, it's not just me. But unfortunately, the barbecue is out the side, and the wind is hitting those flames, kind of almost blowing it out. So we had to put some tables around it and block the wind, and let's not worry about that now. <laughs> let's begin. A Blessing Hidden in Grief by Henry Nouwen. What to do with our losses? We must mourn our losses. Pause. Not just losses of death. Losses of lost dreams, hopes, plans, expectations that have completely failed. They're all losses. We cannot talk or act them away, but we can shed tears over them and allow ourselves to grieve deeply. To grieve is to allow our losses to tear apart feelings of security and safety and lead us to the painful truth of our brokenness. Our grief makes us experience the abyss of our own life in which nothing is settled clear or obvious, but everything is constantly shifting and changing. But in the midst of all this pain, there is a strange, shocking, yet very surprising voice. It's the voice of the one who says, blessed or blessed are those who mourn, for they shall, will be comforted. That's the unexpected news. There is a blessing hidden in our grief. Not those who comfort are blessed, but those who mourn. Somehow in the midst of our tears, a gift is hidden. Somehow in the midst of our mourning, the first steps of the dance takes place. Somehow the cries that well up from our losses belong to our songs of gratitude. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Psalm 34, 18. May that devotional be for those who have ears to hear. This week I had some things that made me pause and ponder. And some of them, again, they're eclectic. They're all over the place. They're not connected to each other. They might be connected to the message. They might have nothing to do with it, but it made me stop. It got my attention. Everything on earth is borrowed. There is no mine or yours. There's only ours. Even time is borrowed. We kill over a plot of land that belongs only to our mother earth. All you have is what you came with and what you will leave with, your spirit. Is a Native American proverb. Maybe this is a good reminder in light of our stress, our expectations, stuff we want to have, or stuff we're trying to keep. It's just a powerful reminder. This next one, meditation practice. This meditation practice is so that you can get good at life, not good at meditation. I thought, ha, isn't it funny? We have all these meditation gurus. Come, learn how to meditate and get better at meditation when it's got nothing to do with meditation. It has to do with peace in your life. I haven't figured it out yet, don't worry. <laughs> There's moments. I'm, I'm seeing a few more moments of peace rather than long bursts of it. But I thought that was a great reminder to lower our expectation. All the darkness in the world cannot extinguish the light of a single candle, Francis of Assisi. This is quite timely for what's going on in our world today with the wars that are going around the world, not just the one war, not the one that's just hitting the news to us. I'm made aware of uh, Myanmar. Anybody know where that is? Uh, it's likely that most of us have not heard of anything going on there. It's not hitting the front of the news all the time. It's kind of scrubbed to the 
back or in a small area, but I have friends who've connected there and lived there. And it's brutal. It's the same horrific, innocent lives being taken is happening there by the military like you would not believe. It's horrendous. Same thing in Palestine. Same thing with the attack on Israel. Both of them are committing death to innocence. God is not into death. God is into life. I pray for peace. I got to be careful what I say because I don't want to make this political. But Jesus is for peace. He doesn't take sides. I think Brent in our morning group was saying, you know, that when Joshua was heading towards Jericho to take him out, ha, 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 some guy in a big sword stops him and says, yo, stop. And Joshua realizes, this is angelic, oh boy. And say, are you with us or against us? Are you for us or against us? And the angel said, neither. So, oh. Which side are you on? Oh, we, we choose our side so quick. Put your hand down. Don't pick a side. Pray for peace. Man never at all exists in himself. Man exists in Jesus Christ and in him alone. This is Karl Barth. I found that powerful because in the last maybe a year or two, I see a pendulum swing of deconstructionists and people that are unlearning and relearning, and really it's just discipleship. But I'm hearing this pendulum swing towards uh, I, uh, Christ and I are one, but I am Christ and I, I am God kind of language. You've probably heard it. But that pendulum has crashed into the ditch when really none of us exists in and of ourselves. We exist in Christ. We're in union with God, but we are not God. Be careful with that. Even if you misquote or take the Paul's, Paul's phrase in the New Testament, I think it was in Acts, where he says, we are all gods. It's not talking about God. All right? He's not talking about that divinity. We are divine. But don't equate your divine union with being the actual divine. That is an overswing. And even Jesus didn't brag about trying to be. Hey, look, I'm God. Want a selfie with me? He didn't do that. He called out the religious leaders and gave them crap because they were misrepresenting him. That's why Moses never made it into the promised land because he misrepresented God, misrepresented the character of God. And you say the Bible plainly says, yeah, the Bible plainly shows and reveals the mistakes, the misrepresentations. <laughs> we have a lot to learn. For Jesus, there, is no, there are no countries to be conquered, no ideologies to be imposed, and no people to be dominated. There are only children, women, and men to be loved, humans to be loved. Henry Nouwen. We don't see us versus them. If you do, keep praying that your eyes may get cleared. Keep praying that God will allow you the ability to see light in others, to see Christ in everyone. Then peace will become reality around you. The meaning of Scripture does not reside in the grammar of the text but in the person of Jesus Christ. I love that one because I hate grammar. <laughs> Spell check, grammar check, all that fun stuff. We can get so addicted to the written scriptures and miss the heart of Christ. It's so easy to do that. I like this. I realize today how nice it is not to be worried about other people's faith journeys and the way they live their life and trying to control them. I think this should be posted in every church. <laughs> how, my goodness, I remember growing up and even as a pastor, just starting out, you know, I'm a pastor, I'm supposed to help control the behaviors of people. You're told, but that's baloney. That's a joke. It really is. 
Instead, when you take away the need to have to control someone else's behavior, because you really are uncomfortable with something, and just surrender them. There's so much more peace without trying to control. How about just love? And all those things that you think you're trying to understand before you love or you need to accept before you love, acceptance and understanding are not prerequisites to love. They're fruit of love. Do you hear that? I love this. Sometimes we say deconstructing my faith when what we really mean is I just discovered that faithful followers of Jesus for centuries read the Bible differently than I've been taught to. I thought, okay, now we're getting closer and closer to what deconstruction really is. <laughs> it's just a buzzword for today. It's okay. Just it's not the answer. I just thought that was really good. Lastly, a universal prayer for peace. Lead us from death to life, from falsehood to truth. Lead us from despair to hope, from fear to trust. Lead us from hate to love, from war to peace. Let peace fill our lives, our world, our universe. Peace, peace. Peace. Dave, if you're going in the kitchen, can you stir my chili? It's true. It's, it's, it's got to be stirred. <laughs> Did Jesus really say that? Last week we ended with the um, uh, part of the Sermon on the Mount with the Lord's Prayer. And um, I said I wished I had a certain slide up, so I'm going to go right to those slides. And I want to share with you an, an Aramaic. I'm not saying it's the correct one because there isn't a correct one. It's not the answer. It's like another translation. Do you know how I've shared with you multiple translations? When some people think King James Bible is the one that Jesus read. It's like, that's hilarious. But then you have all these other translations, and none of them were English. right? All these English is just a translation from other written texts and so on. But the language Jesus spoke was Aramaic. There's a Hebrew connection to it. There's more depth and meaning to the Hebrew language. Those who speak Hebrew and understand Hebrew and have a Jewish background understand the Hebrew language better and all the sub-meanings where our English is kind of cold and blah. That's the comparison. Like they are a, to understand the Hebrew and Jewish language, it's like this incredible carnival with shows and lights and entertainment and then the English Western understanding is, hmm, let's have a committee meeting. Like that, that's how bad of a difference it is, and we need to see, we need to explore and hear other lenses. So I've shared with you the First Nations translation, the Passion translation, the RSVAN, whatever, the, the, all these other translations. This is an Aramaic one, so I'm going to share two different Aramaic type translations. So you can hear the Lord's Prayer a little bit differently. And then the last slide of the three is a better understanding of what was meant when it says, if you don't forgive, God's going to get you. <laughs> Remember that one? It doesn't mean that at all. Let's, let's, let's take a look at this. I, I just love this. The Lord's Prayer and Aramaic version. Beloved Father, who fills all realms... May you be honored in me. May your divine rule come now. Let your will come true in all the universe, in the heavens and on earth. Give us all that we need for each day and untangle the knots of unforgiveness that bind within as we also let go of the guilt of others. Let us not be lost in superficial things, but let us be free from that which keeps us from our true purpose. From you comes all rule, the strength to act, and the song that beautifies all from age to age. Amen. Well, that's different. <laughs> in fact, I saw a connection to the First Nations version and the Passion Translation in this. There's a connection. But this next one's even more wild. This is an Aramaic, another Aramaic version. 
The prayer to our Father, it's a bit small for you to read, but it's good. And I'm not going to pronounce it because I can't say Abu Ain. I don't get all that. So uh, there's that one. O thou from whom the breath of life comes, who fills all realms of sound, light, and vibration, may your light be experienced in my utmost holiest, your heavenly domain approaches. Let your will come true in the universe, all that vibrates, just as on earth that is material and dense. Give us wisdom, understanding assistance, for our daily need. Detach the fetters of faults that bind us, <laughs> karma, like we let go the guilt of others. Let us not be lost in superficial things like materialism, common temptations, but let us be freed from that what keeps us off from our true purpose. You, from you comes the all-working will, the lively strength to act, the song that beautifies all and renews itself from age to age. Sealed in trust, faith and truth, I confirm with my entire being. That hits my heart. That's another menu item in understanding the Lord's Prayer. It's not the answer. And it might be so radically different than what you've read, but this is an Aramaic translation of that, given their culture and context. That's why I like the Passion Translation, because it's translated from an Aramaic perspective. But here's the best part. The Lord's Prayer, a better meaning. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Uh, detach the fetters of faults that bind us like we let go of the guilt of others. That's the comparison of the two. Now, here's the best part. And I said this verbally last week, but here it is. And if you don't forgive others, your Heavenly Father will not forgive you. Um, it can be better understood like this. If you don't unfetter the chains on others, I won't do it for you. Very different than holding back conditional forgiveness. Because nothing else that Jesus shared fits the narrative, I'm not going to forgive you because I told you one time in Matthew, you know, sorry, your eternity's lost because you chose not to forgive. That is not in character with Christ. There's something deeper here we need to understand. That's why I want to share this. I want to add this to your menu list of understanding this. If you've only been told one cold business meeting, committee meeting style interpretation of what this means, there's a lot more color for you coming. The more you study, the more you look, the more you dig deeper, and may the Holy Spirit be your teacher, not me. I'm just sharing with you what I'm learning and discovering, and I find hope in this. To me, this is a more hope-filled perspective. But let's move on. Matthew 6, Passion Translation. Concerning fasting, it says, when you fast, don't look like those who pretend to be spiritual. They want everyone to know they're fasting, so they appear in public looking miserable, gloomy, and disheveled. Do you know what that is? It's called acting. I'm on a stage, an acting stage, acting miserable, looking sad. You can just imagine, have a little bit of fun with it. I'll be careful not to. <clears throat> but that's what a hypocrite is, acting like who you aren't, playing a role. And in fact, almost all of the Matthew 6 things, because the beginning we heard about prayer, we heard about giving, and now it's talking about fasting. The whole context here seems to be um, um, putting on a show, trying to get attention. Because the religious leaders are really good at this. We're called to not do this for attention. So how come you're sitting at the table with just a glass of water? I'm fasting. <laughs> Find another way to fast. Like if you have to, it's fine. Sometimes we need to fast for health reasons, and that's fine. Sometimes people fast to lose weight or gain weight. Sometimes people fast activities. They fast TV. They fast whatever. But then be honest, what is the fasting purpose? And um, a discussion I heard last week on the Matthew study with the Open Table Conference, the, the short story of fasting 
has to do with not letting your ego and flesh run your life. You're not living from all your, your, your compulsion and all your desires to just get what you want and, and give in to every temptation. It's, it's don't let your body run that, but let your mind. Sometimes we let our bodies and our, our taste buds kind of run things. <laughs> Quit laughing. I know it's true. <laughs> Believe me, they've received their full reward. When you fast, don't let it be obvious, but instead wash your face, groom yourself, and realize that your father in the secret place is the one who is watching all that you do in secret and will continue to reward you openly. I don't know what the rewards are. Um, the closest understanding I can get to the reward is internal of the peace, the awakening of the oneness we have. That's the reward. Because we forget all the time. We forget we are one with Christ. There is no separation like Lori was talking about in the songs. We forget that. So the fasting can be a way to just like self-discipline. You know, I wish some people would not fast the shower. Just, <laughs> right? Like, do you know what I mean? Like, there's things that we need to do to take care of ourselves. And even here, it says, groom yourself. Take care of yourself. Because we live with people. You are not an individual island. Our culture right now is so focused on self as a me, 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 meism, my will, my rights, my true self, which we hear all the time. You don't have to tell me about your true self. I know your true self according to Christ, and your true self is union with Jesus. Spirit. Not all the stuff you add on or put attention on. Because many who try to find themselves are not looking for themselves. They think they are, but they're not looking in. They're looking out. And you'll never find it. It'll never satisfy. And some people don't realize it until they're dead or the consequences of their choices have paid the full due. In Matthew 6, it says, uh, concerning treasures, don't keep hoarding magazines because you have issues. Sorry. <laughs> don't keep hoarding for yourselves earthly treasures <laughs> that can be stolen by thieves, material wealth, eventually rusts, decays, and loses its value. Instead, stockpile heavenly treasures for yourselves that cannot be stolen and will never rust, decay, or lose their value, for your heart will always pursue what you value as your treasure. What did we just read? We kind of got that part. For your heart will always pursue what you value as your treasure. Always. Almost every translation has that kind of a strong meaning here. Now, um, my parents have passed away, so I can say all this. <laughs> but uh, they saved up stuff. They hoarded. It was a nightmare to clean their place out. It was a one-and-a-half-story bedroom home, and we had eight dumpsters, and it still didn't finish. I'm not kidding. This is not even exaggerating. But they stored up. Treasures they thought were treasures. In fact, Y2K, remember that fear thing about the world's going to end? Well, they bought into it and stored up their crap. They sure did, because we had to clean it 25 years later. And guess what happened to it? Decay. Gone. We thought perhaps there might be something valuable. I remembered so many things that they may have had in their home. That, hey, we're going to save that. Look for it. And we have to look through everything. What a waste of time, unfortunately, but we had no other choice. Because by the time we did find something half decent, there was mold because it fit into a corner because there was clothes and then a coffee spilled on. They never cleaned it up and more. It just got worse and worse and worse. They lived in this for years. It was awful. Good thing they're with Jesus now and they can't hear me. Because they were so embarrassed about their life that when you walked in the front door, guess what they did? They had a curtain across the door so you couldn't see in the kitchen because it was horrible. 
that maybe the living room kind of cleaned up and a curtain closing off to the other side because they were clearly shamed by it and they knew at one level, this is awful. Saving up treasures. Don't be like my parents. (laughs) And I don't want to be like my parents in that sense. But this reminded me of that. Although, let me give them credit. I believe most of their hoarding was a mental health issue. Not, I'm trying to save because the stuff they saved was weird, okay? Made no sense whatsoever. (laughs) But there was an ill health in their thinking and then became weak. And when you are weak and unable to clean that up, you need help, but you're too embarrassed to get help and just grows into a disaster. And some people's lives are like that. All the little pileups, they quickly close the door to those rooms, don't let you see into those cupboards, because it's just awful. Just watch the hoarding shows. They'll teach you. (laughs) But that's not what that's talking about. This is talking about the treasures. The things you value the most. Is it the property, the jewels, the cash? Is it what, what is the value? Do you value people? Because this is pointing back the result, the residual result of this should be people that we value one another. Not the stuff. The eye of your spirit allow revelation light to enter into your being. If your heart is focused, the light floods in. But if your eyes are focused on money, stingy or greedy, the light cannot penetrate and darkness takes its place. How profound will be the darkness within you if the light of truth cannot enter? Now, another translation says, if the light that is in you, if that light is darkness to you, how great is that darkness? Let's see what the First Nations translation says. I, I love this. This is incredible. Among the tribes of wrestles with creator, Israel, Where do you think they got that from? Isn't that cool if you know your Old Testament history? The name of Jacob wrestling with God. Among the tribes of wrestles with creator, Israel, a greedy person was said to have have a bad eye and unable to see the good road. A generous person was said to have a good eye full of light and able to clearly see the good road. Helping our choices, decision making. Here it goes. So he said to them, light shines into the body through the eye. If your eye is clear, your whole body, your whole being is full of light. But if your eye is bad, then your whole being is full of darkness. If the only light you have is darkness, then the darkness is very great. Oh, how great is that darkness. And yet, light is in you. But you're blind to it. The issue is blindness. And then serving two masters? How could you worship two gods at the same time? You will have to hate one and love the other, be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot worship the true God and the God of money. Now, it's not just the God of money. And you know how in the, we've heard it said that money is the root of all evil? It, 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 that's not the translation, folks. That's a... One translation or misunderstanding is the root of many kinds of evil is the correct translation. So be careful that we don't demonize money because money can be used for good or bad. It's how we use it. So the, the quick religious judgments, that's what I'm, I'm calling out because I've seen it and heard it way too long. But this is about what do you, do you value? Only the money and you're working just for the money? Or are you open to all that God may have in front of you? Right? It's pretty, I thought it was pretty powerful. And then, do not worry. I know we all love this section because none of us do this. This is why I tell you to never be worried about your life, for all that you need will be provided, such as food, water, clothing, everything your body needs. Isn't there more to your life than a meal? Isn't your body more than clothing? Look at all the birds. Do you think they worry about their existence? They don't plant or reap or store up food, yet your heavenly Father provides them each with food. Aren't you much more valuable to your Father than they? So 
Which one of you, by worrying, could add anything to your life? And why would you worry about your clothing? Look at the beautiful flowers of the field. They don't work or toil. And yet, not even Solomon in all of his splendor was robed in beauty more than one of these. So, if God has clothed the meadow with hay, which is here for such a short time, and then dried up and burned, won't he provide for you the clothes you need, even though you live with such little faith? So then, forsake your worries. Why would you say, what will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear? For that is what the unbelievers chase after. Doesn't your heavenly Father already know these things your body requires? I'm going to pause there for a minute. I have got, I got a number of questions in my head that uh, I, uh, kind of bug me about this. And yet, this is not talking necessarily about every day. This is about your goal for life. My goal is to always have great clothes, great car, great house. It's, that it's, it's, it's not just the daily. If you remember last week, we talked about give us our daily bread. It's not talking about just the food, the sandwich. <laughs> It's, it's talking about full needs for today, tomorrow, and beyond. It's, there's more to this than we've been told. And so the, we have that. Then I have the question, what about all those that don't have food today? That are scurrying around trying to find clothes. That are starving. That are being bombed and have no food, water. What about them? Where's God in that? That's a really good question. And there are no easy answers. I do know God is there. Unfortunately, I think he's weeping a whole lot more than us. I really do. God is not absent from their pain. And those that are being killed are being killed with the love of Christ around them and ushered into glory. They're seeing things better than we can. But we who have the ability to help how can we help? And that's a multi-layered question. We can think overseas all we want, but what about your own town? What about your own cities? What about those that you know of elsewhere? Like it's, we start to realize how self-centered we really are in some ways. And it's a little bit embarrassing because we preach other-centered love. <laughs> So above all, constantly chase after the realm of God's kingdom and the righteousness that proceeds from him. Then all these less important things will be given to you abundantly. We do have our needs met. We really do. Every person listening to this right now, we have our needs met. It's our wants that likely are not being met. Refuse to worry about tomorrow, but deal with each challenge that comes your way, one day at a time. Sounds like a hymn. One day at a time, sweet Jesus. Anyway, whatever that one is. Tomorrow will take care of itself. This is important. And I'm speaking to myself now, because I can have worries that go into tomorrow or next year and think, well, if that happens, then... What am I going to do if that happens? I have to have a backup plan for that. And then if that happens, I have to, what about it goes the other way? Then I have to plan for that. And then, oh, wait, it's a year away. What am I doing? That has nothing to do with financial planning. Okay, just in case some of you financial planners are like, well, but you're supposed to plan for the future. And that's all great. But it's our worrying, the constant, what is taking up active residence in our mind, it should show a pattern to you by now. You'll know what that is. Each one has a different one. Each one of us. Let's see what the First Nation says. I love this. If you will make Creator's good road your first aim, representing His right ways, He will make sure you have all you need for each day. Do not worry about tomorrow's troubles. It is enough to trust Creator to give you the strength you need to face today. That is a great ending. Who do you trust? Do you trust your own self-sufficiency? You see, in the West, many don't need God because they are their own little gods controlling their little futures with the money they make and the decisions they make and the power rankings and the jockeying for positions. 
And yet, is that what we're supposed to be yearning for? I don't think so. Yearn for the righteousness of God. Seek first the righteousness of God. What is it? Well, some of it is seeing God's righteousness in others. That's a great beginning. Oh, wait, some of us need to see it in ourselves first because we still don't see it. Let Jesus be the one who reveals to you. Let's close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, will you speak to each of our hearts in the most gentle way that you usually do and encourage our souls if we need it? For those who are ready for some direction, will you give gentle direction? For those who have questions and they aren't ready for the answers, give them peace and have them surrender their questions to you so you can give the answers when and if it is necessary. May we cease to live from control freak flesh and live from the Christ in us, abiding the one who gives us life and sustains us, who meets all of our needs. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.